Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. It's time to eat, drink, and be merry with your host, Lisa and Nancy. So happy Wine Wednesday, everybody, or should we say Shine Wednesday? It's Shine. It's Wine and Shine. It's the Shine. It's the Shine. <laughs> it's all about the Shine. Uh, it is October 3rd, 2018, and welcome to Big Blend Radio's Happy Hour Show. We're streaming live from a sunny Tucson, Arizona, and we're your hosts, Nancy Reed and Lisa Smith, the crazy mother-daughter travel team and publishers of the digital interactive Big Blend Radio and TV magazine, as well as Parks and Travel magazine. Uh, that covers, guess what that covers? Uh, maybe Parks and Travel? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. good name. And Big Blend, guess what that is? Oh, that could be like a whole bunch of stuff. Stuff? <laughs> stuff? Are you already like taking a sip? You are. Well, of course. Yeah, she is. It's, it's wiggy time. This is really what it's about. And, and uh, I know listeners over the years, you know Nancy and I call happy hour wiggy time. It's about taking that first sip. And it goes down, the and as it goes down the backbone, you start just wigging it. It's you know, a little wiggle at You're, the end. Everybody needs to wiggle the cheeks. Just gonna say <laughs> that has Uh-oh, to happen. So anyway, you can keep up with our publications. Go to bigblendmagazines.com, bigblendradio.com for our schedule as well. Today's show, I'm super excited. I, I know, know you are. Fun. You're hugging the book, like you've stolen the moonshine book. I'm waiting for the jug to pop out. The the three X <laughs> jug. With the three X's That's on really it? That's good, didn't it? I know. Yes. I uh, want the jug of moonshine to come with the You're jugging it. Okay, I got mason jars here, but now you're jugging it. Well, yeah. Okay, well, that's right. That's how the mothers roll. That's right. Uh, we have author John Schlimm joining us, and he's going to talk about his awesome new book. It's called Moonshine, A Celebration of America's Original Spirit. Rebel Spirit, excuse that's me. That's it. It is the rebel spirit. And, like, I want to do a rebel mm-hmm. yell right now. Woo! More. Well, more. More. Well. Well, a shine. rebel yell, you know. Mm, yeah. Little Billy Idol could happen tonight. You never know. There, you, it could be a music night. It could be. Um, this is just an awesome book. Everyone needs it. Uh, you need to put it in your bootlegger Christmas stockings. I'm just saying. <laughs> Christmas stockings. I know it's coming. <laughs> I know it's October, stockings. you know. Uh, right now the shelves are battling out, you know, is it the Christmas tree or, or the spider cobwebby things for Halloween? I know. This so. all jumbled into one thing now. Speaking of things like that, uh, after our show, we're, uh, after our segment with John, excuse me, we're going to be uh, airing some interviews I did. One was on location with Heather Witherington, a mixologist at the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill, where we've spent a few Halloweens, happy Halloween yes. nights, uh, partying with mm-hmm. spiders and drinks and things. I got the spider right there. She's going to share how to make her Yuma Criminals Kool-Aid cocktail recipe. And that is inspired by the name of the high school football team, and there's a cool story behind that. Yes. And uh, also we're going to be hearing from Hillary Larson of Northwinds Wine Consulting. I chatted with her, and she's going to share some tips on decanting wine. Apparently that's that's there's ways to do it that, you know, you want your wine to be good. It's got to breathe. So this really, truly is a wine and shine show mm-hmm. today. So we're excited about that. We've got some great music. Tennessee Whiskey by Shelley King. Awesome, awesome. Cool. One of the first ladies of music of Austin, Texas. And Holy Water from Allison August. It's like, you know. You've been blessed. Yes. Uh, we want to thank the International Food Wine Travel Writers Show uh, Association. <laughs> Excuse me, I just had one sip and that's it. Oh, Let really? me try again. Yeah. The International Food Wine Travel Writers Association for sponsoring our radio show today. Uh, they are awesome. They're a global network of journalists. They cover hospitality and lifestyle and travel, wine, moonshine, the whole thing, and also the destinations. So if you're in the industry, go check it out. Go to ifwtwa.org, as we say, iftwa. See? So check it out. Good new website, too. I like it. I know. We have a cool show with them. Every second Friday, we interview journalists who have traveled all over, and uh, we hear about wine tasting. We hear about food. We hear about, you know, maybe hiking or power boating or whatever, whatever they experience. That's right. But right now, I'm ready for some shine. How about you? No, go for it. I know. It's time to get John on the show. <laughs> Well now, Dad, 
Them Republicans claim that them Democrats is a drag in their feet, and them Democrats come back and them saying that those Republicans ain't got a leg to stand on. Yeah. That's why I ain't taking no chances. I'm a tonicking them both sides. Right on, Nancy. You you <laughs> took you took the book. Everybody, uh, very excited. She's got the Moonshine Bible. Um, the John Schlim uh, is joining us. He's a Harvard-trained educator, an artist, an award-winning writer, an essayist, author of 18 books, including The Shine. I'm just going to call it The Shine. Mm. Um, he, he's also written uh, an award-winning memoir, the Christopher Award-winning memoir, Five Years in Heaven. All kinds of cookbooks that have some, you know, wiggy to it, like you know, moonshine, wine, cocktail. It's Cocktailing it's book. Kind of obvious. We're excited about liquor. Yeah. Well, he's got the ultimate beer lovers happy hour. Ooh. So he really does belong on our happy hour show here on Big Blend Radio. He's got the tipsy vegan. I like that because a lot of times they think if you're a vegan that you should sit in your corner with your carrot stalk and you don't get wine, you don't get any of that. So that's I like this. He's also the author of the ultimate beer lovers cookbook, the largest beer cookbook ever published, and it was awarded the best beer book in the world and Best Beer Book in the United States by Gourmand International. Cool. So he's a perfect guest here. Uh, very excited uh, to have him here on Happy Hour right here on Big Blend Radio. He's going to talk about his awesome new book. It's called Moonshine, a celebration of America's original rebel spirit. And Nancy stole one of his quotes <laughs> from the book. It's from Granny. I know. Anybody who likes cocktails needs to have this book. If you like to mix them, you like to drink them, if you like to research the history behind the shine, you need this book. So go get it on Amazon, all those places, uh, Barnes & Noble, your bookstores. Uh, but I also say go to his website. I, I love to send people directly to the author. Go to johnschlim.com, and that's S-C-H-L-I-M-M.com, just making sure everybody knows I know how to spell, even though it's happy hour. Welcome, John. How are you? Hey, you two. It is so great to be with literally two of the funnest people in the world. So we are going to have uh, such a great time. And I am totally with you on that wiggy feeling. And nothing gives you that wiggy feeling like a first sip of 180 proof moonshine. <laughs> Woo! Wow. You know, this is so exciting. We're so thrilled to have you and uh, on the show and, and talk about shine. Nancy and I, um, we, you know, before we were, went live here, we were talking about you know, Nancy and I travel a lot. We go to national parks and cover the parks and communities, all parks, actually. It, it's, you know, it could be your county park. We're always in search of the perfect place to have a, you know, a wiggy picnic. you got to walk, and then you get to have a reward of good food and a little wiggy libation. And um, what's interesting, reading Moonshine, and I love this. Nancy's holding the She won't give me the book back. Um, <laughs> we want to do a shine trail with this. And... We've we had our a small taste of moonshine in Louisiana, <laughs> central Louisiana, a few years back. That was way cool. In our hotel, the hotel manager said, you need to go to happy hour. And we were out uh, filming gators. grave sites and gators at this point. <laughs> you need to be here at 5 o'clock, she says to me. And this is a brand name hotel, and I'm not going to give it out. She says, you need to be here. And um, she says, just listen to me. You need to be here. No matter. She wouldn't tell us why, but of course, we tell everybody's taking around, take us around. We need to be back for happy hour. Apparently, this is a big deal. I'm like, what could happen at a typical brand hotel that's you know unique? <laughs> we walk in. There is a man who was selling and serving his <laughs> shine out of the back of his car. He would run out, take orders, and then bring him back in. And he was like the little bar manager dude. This is Central Louisiana. <laughs> and people bought it, and they were going to try and take one guy was taking going to try and get it over and fly home with it back to North Carolina. And I'm like, isn't that where it came from? Is this legal? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to plead the fifth on that, and uh, I just say I hope you enjoyed uh, what he had to offer. <laughs> Absolutely. That was that was the only shine we've had, and mm -hmm. um, I, they had different flavors. He had like this is cherry, this is banana. And um, I, I'm like, my eyebrows went up, and I started to get really kind of happy. I had a really good night's sleep. And then um, the only other shine we've had is our, our friend, our, one of our experts, Ralph Mason Gill Jr., uh, our change agent who comes on our business show, sent us a mason jar with a whiff of shine because it wasn't really in there, but he's in East Tennessee, but you could smell it. And I tried to lick the lid of the mason jar, and I about <laughs> fell over. 
<laughs> so this is now we have had, or at least I have had. Sorry, you were too young when we lived in South Africa. What they call Vic Blitz, Vic Blitz, which is white, white lightning. lightning, and um, you could go into most bars and get a little shot, which was about a bottle cap of a bit blitz mm. that would it makes your ears burn. Well, this is this is what I want to know. It's really good if you're sick. What is shine exactly compared to like whiskey or bourbon and and you know those different spirits? Well, you know, it, it's a close cousin, um but it's certainly not the same thing. Uh, moonshine is super simple and this is what the moonshiners understood and this is why it was su- such a success. It basically is just fresh water, corn, yeast, uh, and if you uh, really want, you can put in some flavoring. I certainly have some infusions that we can talk about in the mm. book. But it's mm. it's simple. It's clean. Uh, you send it through that copper pot still, and uh, out comes really pure magic, pure magic in a, a mason jar. And uh, the moonshiners understood this because that's what they had access to on their farms. They had the fresh uh, mountain water, and they had uh, fields of corn. And so they have now gifted us with this amazing drink that we get to enjoy. But it now became legal in some places, right? And and we can, I mean, like, wasn't it like five, six, seven years ago that we couldn't really buy it? Or that, yeah, that's sort of the beauty of this. 250 year journey of the moonshiners uh, when I really started delving into their history I just fell in love with these men and women uh, you know mm. these are folks we yeah. really want to party with uh, they uh, okay you know, from the very be- <laughs> yeah, right you know they I'm yeah. like these are our people we we get them they were uh, you know these farmer entrepreneurs and patriots and artisans and they really handcrafted their own destiny and uh, they they fought for that American dream and to achieve that dream for 250 years and here we are and we get to reap the benefits because now it's legal now it's legit uh you still need a license that's why you know there's legitimate distilleries popping up everywhere but you know we can go into these distilleries we can go into liquor stores anywhere and there are whole sections of moonshine so uh, this is something that's been in the works for 250 years even before our country was the united states they were here uh making moonshine and it, I'm very grateful to them for that. <laughs> I, yeah, we are too. This is fun. And the, the recipes and the infusions, because you go like into restaurants and you'll see like they're infusing their own vodkas. And that's pretty much what you see the most of is the infusion yes. is vodka. But I never thought about the infusions of shine. I'm sorry. I just like to say shine. <laughs> that's, a good word. that's okay. Uh, you, you know, Moonshine Day, any other name, is still just as sweet and potent. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, it was really important for me when I was working on this book to contribute something new to the discussion, something new and really fun to the discussion mm-hmm. of Moonshine. And there have certainly been other historical and even academic-type books done on Moonshine, and that's great. We need those kind of books, but that was never going to be the, the book I was going to write. I like to write a party in a book. So the history I told is told in a fun way that you can sit down on a Saturday or Sunday mm-hmm. afternoon with a mason jar beside you and just laugh your way through it and learn a little history. But then, of course, I had to add, you know, over 100 recipes for moonshine infusions and moonshine cocktails. So it's really like two books in one, uh, but it was important for me to contribute something new to uh, to the moonshine uh, story. So have you... Um, did you make up these recipes and, and have you tested them all? That's important. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. And yes. Well and I have to tell you, I didn't have to look very far for willing taste testers. Uh, you know, okay. my friends and strangers are like were at the, uh, at the door knocking when it t- came time to test these. And had I known you two, <laughs> I would have had oh, you man. over. <laughs> hey, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll be coming to a town near you if you do another one of these books. I, you know, because this is the thing. You seem to have so much fun with your books. You know, um, I think what what started all of this, I hear that you are, are related to the family who started, like, one of the first breweries in this country. I mean, is this something that, you know, just shine and, and bubbles and wiggy flow through your veins? <laughs> uh, do, do you notice a trend here? Yeah. You know, yes, the love we of like all it. things boot. 
the love of all things boozy really does flow through my veins. Uh, my great great grandfather founded our straw brewery here in St. Mary's in the 1870s. So we're now the third oldest wow. brewery in the country. And, you know, I'm fifth generation. I sit on the board of directors. And, you know, it's really an exciting heritage to be a part of. And that's why I've uh, been inspired to write so many of the, the beer books that I've done. Uh, but what was also great, you know, as I was getting to know the moonshiners through my research, they really reminded me of my great great grandfather, of, you know, that 19 year old immigrant mm. who came over from Germany with nothing more than some gold pieces sewn into his jacket and yeah. a recipe for beer. And he, he right. wanted to achieve right. the American dream just like they did. And here we are, uh, you know, Strawberry is about to turn 150 years old uh, in a few years. So, um, I, I just love that we, you know, have those roots. And really every family has a great roots if people start digging. Uh, they might not all be boozy, but that's okay. I've got them covered. <laughs> well, I love this, the family history part. We actually do a show, a third, fa a third Friday family history show, um, because it's, it's really interesting. And every time you turn around in history, you're going to find a shiner in some format, <laughs> whether it's beer, wine, or shine. Um, you know, there's going to be some family recipe that goes through. Um, but it, it's interesting, too, because um, we've actually done some history um, in Yuma, Arizona. Here is the corner of the southwest, you know, southwest corner of Arizona. And some of the history there, some of the very first families are of Scottish descent, and they were talking about their great great grandfather, the Lutz, Lutz uh, mm -hmm. family. Um, they owned a casino, which isn't a casino now, but back in the day it was. But it was hidden, like they had hidden um, copper stills and things like that. And apparently they were making shine, and like the great great grandfather or something got in trouble. So it came all the way to the southwest, and that makes sense because you think about how people, you know, migrated across the country. Um, but it's interesting, your family coming from the English side and then, and then the German side, but isn't, now we've got like, it's Scottish mostly when it comes to the shine. Yeah, and you know, what is great uh, concerning, uh, you know, the heritage I come from and, and, the, and the, the Moonshine book is, Tomorrow night, I'm bringing all of that together. We're doing a, a launch party for the book at uh, my family's brewery. And we, mm -hmm. we have this uh, thing at the brewery called the Eternal Tap, uh, which <laughs> is a, a tourist de destination for people from around the country. And it's just like it sounds. The beer never stops flowing from the Eternal Tap. So tomorrow night uh, at the well, launch party funny. for the Moonshine book, there's going to be you know, beer, and we're bringing in a local moonshine distillery, uh, one of the first ones in the area, and I'm bringing those two worlds together, and I just, I have to think that my great-great-grandfather, as well as all those original moonshiners, are going to be up above smiling down and nodding. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, an idea is floating through my little brain here. How about when we're on our tour Every town or place that we go, you come up with a moonshine recipe. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, we want to do a shine trail. I know we need to do something. We're going to call you from Shine Shinevilles. Do you think that um, there's shineries uh, like shineries. Across, across the country? Are there specific <laughs> regions? I mean, we always think Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, right? Are, are there specific regions we need to focus on for the shine? <laughs> well, those are. The those are definitely uh, home base for some of the original uh, distilleries. But uh, the great thing uh, is uh, moonshine distilleries are popping up across the country. So I think just about anywhere you go, you're going to find one. And uh, I will certainly be right along there with you in spirit. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> he's, got, he's, he's high in spirits there. We like that. I know we're excited. We're going to be going to Kentucky uh, next year we're going to do the bourbon trail, so I'm going to be like, okay, were well, you shiners first? You know, um, but it's interesting because they have like a whole bourbon archaeology thing happening mm -hmm. out of um, you know, Springfield, Kentucky is one of the the places we're going, and uh, we were talking to you know uh, Nicholas out there, uh, Lara Quincy, if I'm saying his last name correctly, but he does this archaeology, and they're finding old like stills and like the the, the old 
you know, things that they did things in to make it, to make the bourbon and the shine. Equipment would be Yeah, there word. you go, the things. <laughs> but he's going out there, and that is so cool to think about the history that is coming out from underground that um, made people happy for so many years. I want to do that. Absolutely. And, and that's why I was so excited to be able to do the historical portion mm. of this book the way I did mm. it, because I really wanted to capture that just fantastic energy and spirit. And uh, you, you can just tell that the moonshiners always had a good time. Uh, you know, even when they mm. weren't exactly supposed to be doing what they were doing, even when they were out running the police, which, you know, might not be so <laughs> advisable today. Uh, but, uh, you know, they had a good time. You know, they had this maneuver they did uh, called the 180 that I write about in the book. And when the police mm. would be chasing the bootleggers through the dirt roads and the haulers and the, the hills down south, uh, they would do this sharp turn mm. and they would spin the car around and they would just uh, smile and wave as they passed the <laughs> police going in the opposite direction. <laughs> Wow, wow. I love that. But that, isn't that where the, the NASCAR part comes in? It, because this is the yeah. cool thing to me. Mm-hmm. Like, I love that. One of America's, isn't it? Yeah. Like we talk about the American rebel spirit, but here it goes from the shine to NASCAR. That's got to like be right up there with football <laughs> for Americans. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we I, I do a whole chapter on how mm. moonshine paved the way for NASCAR. We really would not have NASCAR if it hadn't been for moonshine. Uh, back in the day when you had the uh, bootleggers and their uh, hot rods racing through, the uh, again, the haulers and the, the hills, uh, on the weekends, they, uh, they, you know, they had a little bit of an ego going. They all thought they were the quickest driver. Mm. So they started racing each other in cow pastures. <laughs> and uh, cool. you know, which which who doesn't? You know, I would happily sit there and cheer them on with a jar of shine if I had been back then. Um, you know, and I come from stock car. My dad was a stock car driver back in the day, so I can oh, certainly right appreciate mm-hmm. those origins. And uh, but yeah, they they would race in pastures, and eventually uh, that became formalized into what we now know is NASCAR. So there'd be all those like mason jars in the trunk of the car clinging and clanging as they spin around doing the 180 and them damn revenors. That sounds like me shopping. (laughs) (laughs) Clang, 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 goes the trolley. But that, it's so exciting because when you think about this history, do you feel like you are writing the, when Nancy, because Nancy stole your book. Um, she keeps, you know, this is, it's the history thing. And I think the recipes are so awesome, but there's this history part of it. Did you feel like, you were writing the history of America in a way like this is our, this is it, man. (laughs) This is where it all came from. Yeah, I really did because before I started doing the research and writing this, I really had no idea just how uh, intricately woven the moonshiners were into the history of our country. Uh, And it's really kind of amazing. And I think your listeners will find it amazing when they read the history and see how, uh, you know, the moonshiners, they were some of the first immigrants here on uh, in the here in the United States before it was even the United States. Uh, they they fought in the Revolutionary War. They moved through all these other uh, historical events right up to current day. Uh, all along, the moonshiners played a really important role um, at every stop along history's march. And it's mm-hmm. really cool to see that. And you really start to. Uh, see how these moonshiners and the moonshine that they made is truly as American as apple pie and blue jeans. Uh, And maybe even more so, maybe even more so. Uh, And that's the whole concept. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, yeah, because it comes from here, like jeans, blue jeans come from China, you know. So, <laughs> well, they Japan, do now. Not, uh, <laughs> no, there's other there's cool places that make their own jeans. Go to Detroit. Just saying. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and and you know the whole idea of the rebel spirit. That's what I just fell in love with uh, in these moonshiners, and I realized that. Uh, each one of us, no matter who we are, where we are, we have that rebel spirit in us. We were born right. with that. And, and that's what mm. spurs us on to pursue our dreams and to achieve whatever it is uh, we hope to achieve. And so I, I, I really found their story to be so inspiring. And I, I'm already hearing, even though the book just came out 
um, last week, I'm already hearing from readers across the country how it's actually inspiring them to go out and follow their dreams. Uh, you know, maybe they aren't boozy uh, dreams, but they're their own dreams. And I love well, that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think it's because you're telling the story of people. And I think one thing that I really love is the story of women in the shine. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's because when you think about, you know, the wine industry, we do a lot on wine and um, why, women have been involved in wine and the creation of champagne. I learned that from Hillary Larson, who's up on the show later. She's she's like women had a lot to do with wine, and you know it's taken years for women to have their name on the label. Um, they may have been in the background, um, but women have been involved in in the world of wiggy. And it's the same thing in the world of shine. The one lady, you know how we love national parks. I have to bring up Josephine Duty, and I really wanted to say her name. <laughs> you just wanted to say Duty. I did. <laughs> but she's awesome. Tell, tell us about her. Uh, well, in the book, it, it was important for me to have a, a Moonshiners Hall of Fame. Uh, and by all means, there are certainly more that I could have put in, but, you know, I have only so many pages. But one of them certainly sure. was Josephine Duty. Uh, she was known as the, the bootleg lady of Glacier National Park. Uh, so you'll definitely have to visit uh, – uh, you yeah. know, Glacier National Park and raise a toast to her. But she was originally a, a dance hall gal who uh, started making moonshine and supplying the railroaders uh, who were traveling on the Great Northern Railroad line at Amarius Pass. And so she really made a name for herself in Moonshine, <laughs> as well as a lot of other women. You know, the women were right there alongside the men. Uh, you know, let no one be fooled. The women played just as important a role as the men did in the history of Moonshine. And I really tried to capture that uh, in the book. In fact, we have this incredible photo. I, I worked really hard to get as many historical photos as I mm. could for this book, uh, which was not easy. I, I scoured state archives mm. and historical societies throughout the South and really throughout the country. And uh, there aren't many photos that exist. And so the ones in this book, this really is – uh, the, the largest collection of historical moonshine photos in one place. Uh, but I found this great photo of these two female moonshiners, which I was <laughs> so excited when I came across. It's on page 44 in the book. And it came from Minnesota, uh, uh, a source in Minnesota, which is really interesting. But it's such a fun photo, and I just absolutely loved that. And I loved it how at the beginning you actually quoted uh, Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies, mm. uh, you know, <laughs> that because I went back and researched moonshine in pop culture, and of course, yeah, we all, yeah, we all remember Granny Spring Tonic. And when I came across that uh, clip of how she was going to go to Washington <laughs> and give it to both Democrats <laughs> and Republicans because she thought they both needed it, I thought, boy, that clip is as timely today as it yeah. was then. And again, and again, it's all I'll in pay time. Her. And, I and it care. shows how Go moon, now. Yeah, quick. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah you, you know, it's, it, it just shows moonshine uh, is for everybody. And, you know, that's how I love to write my books. My books are parties that everyone can come yeah. to and have a mm. really good time. <laughs> we need this. You know, that's the thing. Even if you don't drink, this is something – to just really understand some really cool history stories. And, and it's, it's about that connection to people and, and our country and, you know, what was going on and how, you know, when you're out, you know, mining and stuff, you know, you, you're out mining, you're going to want to, you want a wiki at the end of the day, you're working hard or you're going across the country or whatever you're doing. It was not easy back in those days. And most people were drinking some form of wiggy because the water mm. sucked. You know what I mean? Except for when you get to Kentucky. <laughs> Apparently the water, you can just, you know, it's all good. <laughs> but, um, you know, just fr friends who have told me that's why they, they're really good at bourbon is the water. I, I don't know. But we'll find out for sure. What was it that led you to say, okay, you know, I'm going to do moonshine. And did you have some surprises that, you know, along the way that you kind of went, okay, I thought I was going to do it for this reason did you change course at all? Well, I originally wanted to do it just because I really, really, really love moonshine. And <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> you know every, everything should start with that burning, wiggy love that you have inside, right? Yeah. And um, that's where it started. But, 
as I started looking, you know, because when you come up with a book idea, you, you start looking at have there been other books done on this topic? And if so, how can you do it differently? And I found that there weren't too many written on moonshine. And if they were, again, they were very historical, very academic, and I'm grateful for that. But I thought, here's my chance to contribute something mm. really super fun uh, to the conversation mm. of moonshine uh, and hopefully inspire folks along the way just to celebrate life more one sip at a time. And really that mission has never wavered from the time I started working on the book and, you know, and when my agent approached me, you know, so two things happened separately. I, I came up with the idea and I let it percolate in my head for a few years while I was working on some other book projects. And then one day my agent actually came to me and uh, said, look, I, there, there's a publisher who would love for you to do uh, a moonshine book. And I thought, right okay, you know, the stars <laughs> are so aligning. Cool. And I, so I was ready to go. And I said, let's, let's do this. And, and so here we are with the moonshine book. And I'm just so happy it's finally out in the world. I couldn't wait to share this book with the world. And, of course, you, you go through about a year or two of a process of writing it and editing it and pulling it together. So when it finally comes out, it's just the most amazing thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful book, hardcover. And like I said at the beginning of the show, um, you need, everybody needs it in their, you know, their bootlegging stockings for Christmas. You know, you have bootleggings. I, I just, say, you know, I think that's amazing. Jug, I love that. <laughs> I think I think the jug is iconic. I remember as a kid going to Disneyland, and there was some ride with bears or the whatever it was, and the bear was singing the Lord on the saddle, and he had the brown uh, jug with the uh, yeah, exactly and the white like the thing down at the bottom with the three red X's on it. And yeah. I remember that as a kid. And then I've re- I, I have seen in different museums across the, the areas we have traveled, every once in a while you'll see that jug. There's one, I'm pretty sure there's one on Palomar Mountain. Now, whether they're replicas or the No, they, they went across from their, I mean, their family is from their Confederate, they were Confederate soldiers, the Baileys, and right. they, they went across from, uh, I swear they're from Kentucky. I got to check this yeah, out on their so, history. But they founded their own town on, on Palomar Mountain in Southern, in Southern California, and they have all the things that they brought across. I mean, they have their own post office from that. I mean, it's crazy. Now it's a resort, but and it, yeah, they were founded. They founded the place on Palomar Mountain, yeah. in California, like 1880. They've got to. They've like got that. to have a distillery in the backyard. Yeah, somewhere. I know. Well, I'm going to go look. I now. know. <laughs> you really got us on this moonshine thing. Because, you know, think about this. I mean, here's this, you know, lady with what is now, you know, Glacier National Park. Like, Shine is, like, across the country, like you were saying, this is, like, as American as apple pie, but this is, like, a really happy apple pie. I want to talk about <laughs> dessert, but the, the triple X thing, I mean, I this isn't, you know, you know hugs and kisses. This is happy. This is, you know, push the limit, right? With that. <laughs> yes, this is a triple X marks the Thought. Uh, when you see that, you know to go towards it, just like going towards the light. Uh, you know, mm. what it really stands for, or at least did in the beginning, is uh, it, it, it uh, showed how many times the moonshine had been distilled. And the mm. more times it was distilled, the stronger it would be. So, <laughs> so one so X cool. isn't good enough. Two <laughs> X isn't good enough. We want three X. And I, I wouldn't mind four or right. five. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> wow. 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 That's amazing. So I know we're going to be featuring some of your dessert recipes in the November through January issue of Big Blend Radio and TV magazine because everybody wants a good dessert. And, and I'm like, move over. If you've got family coming over, you need to make wiggy desserts. And you might as well have some shine because if you have the, you know, sometimes people have the grumpy Uncle Joe in the corner and maybe he needs a little shine and sweetness. So I'm just saying, for all the grumpy people in your family, <laughs> give them a, a shine dessert because they may not want to try shine, but this might be the way to their hearts. I don't know. What do you think? These these awesome desserts uh, that you have in there. Well, I you know the the best probably dessert cocktail in the book is the Smoky Mountain S'more. Uh, yes. You know who does not love a s'more? So if you have that grumpy, 
<laughs> uncle and <laughs> nobody has time for grumpy. Uh, you know, we want no. happy people. So, you know, have a Smoky Mountain s'more ready for that person the minute they walk in the door. And, you know, it's just like what it, it, it sounds. It's, it's moonshine. And I actually recommend the marshmallow infused moonshine, uh, which I, I give the instructions for in the book, along with chocolate liqueur, chocolate syrup. <laughs> Uh, a mm. chocolate bar, graham crackers, and marshmallows. So it is the whole shebang uh, at 180 yeah. proof. <laughs> oh, it, wow. Yeah. And I love this, too, because, the, okay, number one, you're Smoky Mountains, again, park lovers. Um, and I know that there's some people off distilling in those areas or, or have been. Um, <laughs> I, I love the Moonshiner show, okay? I still do. Okay, and I the little know. dogs and, the you know, the people that doing it. That was so funny. Um, You've got to love that show. Did you sit and geek out on that? I want to go back to this recipe, but did you geek out on that show when you were writing this? Uh, Well, I certainly loved the show, and, you know, I think that the show did so much to really uh, portray the Moonshiners in a fantastic way to the millions of viewers that it had, and so I'm really grateful that we got to see that inside look at some of the modern-day Moonshiners Mm. and how they're really carrying through the traditions and the spirit of the original ones 250 years ago. So I think that show, it's now iconic just like Moonshine itself, and I, I appreciate what it, what it did for Moonshine because I think it really helped to make it go mainstream. You know, almost mm-hmm. any bar you go into these days, there is a Moonshine cocktail on the recipe or on the, right. um, on the menu uh, or, or just straight Moonshine itself. You didn't see that a few years ago. You know, moonshine is the new craft beer where everyone was obsessed with craft beer. They still are. And I'm grateful for that because that keeps my family in business. Uh, But this is really the new craft (laughs) beer. Everyone now wants, you know, this handcrafted moonshine. And I'm just so excited that we get to live in this era. It's probably the booziest era in history. And aren't we great you know blessed Thank to be goodness. a part of it it's the yes. wiggy revolution and and this is what's interesting okay i gotta bring this up but it, and it goes kind of goes with the, the s'mores number i just want to say this on the s'mores because we think about s'mores only in the summertime around a campfire but in Ooh, winter time you could winter. be in a nice snowy mm. setting like in the smoky mountains with mm-hmm. a fire you know nice crackling fire and who wants to, like, not have s'mores at that time? Why do we have to, you know, stop ourselves from doing it year-round? So this is the way to have a year-round s'more. <laughs> Just yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You know, I, when I've written the beer uh, books that I've done in that, everyone always wants me to give them a, uh, a seasonal list. And, you know, everyone likes to drink different beers in different seasons, different wines in different seasons. Mm, My right. rule of thumb has always been, Drink what you want, when you want, and enjoy it. The rules should be there are no rules. (laughs) If you want to have a Bloody Mary at 4 in the morning, Godspeed. Do it. You know, whatever you want. And you've got a good Bloody Mary thing in there, too, man. I was looking at that going, everybody, yeah, move over for, you know, New Year's Day. Mm. There's another way to to get your wiggy happiness on and, and, you know, just continue it's, going it's through. It's a very healthy recipe. It's got, you know, V8 in it and everything. Yeah, yeah. You can, you like, super infuse yourself with goodness. But um, I love this. I love that, you know, the history is part of this. I love the people that you've brought to life. Um, the other part of it is this strength of this history of we're going to do it no matter what the government tells us to do. We're going to still make it, you know. Um, and I find this very interesting for it's timely because look at what's going on with the weed world i mean are you going to do the like the the greenery cookbook next i mean i'm just saying because like if you look at the shine isn't that kind of the same thing as what's going on with the you know the the cannabis revolution here i mean people have been doing it even though you're not and they're going to do it anyway right it's been industrious you know, <laughs> well, you know, it, it's all about the, the revolution and it's all about the rebel spirit. And, you know, it's all about each of us picking what, what revolution do we want to be a part of and uh, just changing the world in some way. Uh, you know, as far as weed, I, you know, those, there's a lot of uh, cookbooks that I've seen out there on that. So certainly mm. people are, are definitely pursuing that. But I think you're right. You know, there are the similarities between uh, the journeys of the two. Um, you know, I, I think weed maybe has a, a few years to, to catch up on moonshine since moonshine has been around for about 250 years yeah. and all of that mm-hmm. history. 
but again, you, you know, the, the point of this book is live life to the fullest. And I love to sort of spread that message with any project I work on. Oh, yeah, he's a rebel spirit. Well, and it, Do you is, listen to Billy Idol ever? It, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Absolutely. Thinking, you know, I love the part in there where you're talking about, like, this is my land. I bought it. I paid for it. So I'm going to do what I want on my land. I like that, you know, kind of uh, feeling there. And then when you consider what we all pay in taxes, this whole country is our land, so we can do what we want. So there. No, no. (laughs) Here we go. Here we go. You you got the shotgun? You're going to get the shotgun out? Hey, I'm looking at these two women. They got these, like, overall dungarees thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they're all smiling. And I could pick actresses, like, to be in a movie just from looking at It Meryl ain't no Street Lucille is, Ball. Meryl Streep <laughs> has got to be one of them. Um, but, they're, yeah, she, she'd be awesome in a movie well, about the, Well, the Moonshiners, they were never deterred. And, again, there's that rebel spirit. And even when uh, Mm -hmm. Prohibition was thrown at them, uh, they turned right around and mastered the art Mm -hmm. of supply and demand. Uh, When the law said, you cannot do this, guess what? All uh, everyone in the country said, but we really want to drink. It almost made everyone want to drink more. And the Moonshiners were there to supply that demand. it's It's an opportunity. That's it. Well, that's, again, going to the cannabis side, there's, like, a weird thing happening. Like, some people are like, it's not, you know, I, I mean, I would not know. <laughs> there's, like, there's, like, there's, like, a thing going on between the people. Some people don't want it legalized so that they can keep doing what they want to do on their land the way they do it because now the regulation of it, the taxation of it. So there's this weird thing well, going you, on. You definitely make less money when something's legal. Yeah. So everything should be illegal. <laughs> No. Well, I, I, w- I would say let's pour ourselves a drink and have a talk about it. <laughs> I like yeah. it. I like that. <laughs> I like that. I'm so glad you're on the show, and I'm so glad you wrote this book, and we connected on this. It's such, again, everybody, put it in your bootlegger stockings. You've got to have it. it. The holidays are here. Don't wait. Do it before Thanksgiving because you need to have the shine for the Thanksgiving. Seriously. Well, yeah, just so you can cook the turkey. Yeah, you need. You need the turkey needs basting. The, 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 the turkey shine. needs some shine. I'm thinking. It won't be as dry as it always comes out. Sorry. No, no, do the shine. But if you're going to try and do the thingy outside with the boiling hot oil thing, and no. do the shine after that. <laughs> I'm just saying, the fire department. You're talking about the deep fried turkey thing that yeah, people yeah. tried to do. Yeah, have you have you Ugh. done any of that, John? Mm-mm. Have you done like the shine at Thanksgiving? <laughs> um, w- well, I always start every Thanksgiving with a happy hour, so <laughs> I carry shine right on through, uh, you know, happy hour, dinner hour, after party, and I'm the one at 4 a.m. having that shiny Mary uh, that you were talking about. <laughs> oh, I'm going to come hang with you. That yeah, is so oh, cool. Absolutely. And then you just go all the way through the rest of December, yeah. you know, and then into January, and then you go, ooh, yeah. epiphany. Okay. I know. <laughs> you can stand up now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. All right, so it is time woo-hoo, to play Happy Hour. Get that mason jar out. Are you ready, John, to play <laughs> I Happy am Hour? Ready. <laughs> now, do you drink your shine in a, in a jar or a glass or the you know the jug, like oh, Nancy? Look. <laughs> Look, I, I'm not picky. If all I had was the palm of my hand, I would drink it out of my, the palm of my hand. Oh. Okay, now we like you even more. There it is. Okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I like this, I like this. So now we want to know for happy hour, okay, if you could have happy hour with anyone in the world alive or passed on, who would it be, okay, because you want to have that discussion. You want to have that happy hour conversation. Of so course. So who would it be? What are you going to drink? And we're going to ask you to choose a recipe from mm-hmm. your book, Moonshine. Everybody, go get it. And uh, what are you going to talk about? But also, where? Where is this going to happen? I love this question, and so I mm-hmm. think that I would choose to have a moonshine cocktail with Jackie Onassis, who Ooh. is one of my most admired people. Uh, classy. Mm. She understood a good time. She understood a good yeah. cocktail, and she loved history. So I think uh, she would be all about this book and the moonshiner. So I'd have a drink yeah. with Jackie Onassis. I would 
um, serve the party in the holler, which is on page 198, uh, and listen to this lineup so in, of ingredients. So in addition to the moonshine, there's also rum, amaretto, oh. gin, beer. Have to have oh the beer goodness. in there, uh, or my family will disown me. I have to have the beer, some ginger ale, some orange and pineapple, and peach juices, and you are good to go. It's a perfect party Whoa. lunch. And I that's think a Mai that, Tai. That's a Mai Tai mixed with moonshine. Yeah, but I like this infusion thing. Kinda. That's my thing. I'm into the infusion. It's like, except for the amaretto. That's all different. So yeah, you pretty th- cool. throw throw in a little umbrella, and you can call it my tie in the holler. Whatever you want to oh, call I it. Oh, like I like that. Uh, yeah, my I tie in it. the holler. I would have that, and I would suggest that she and I sit along a crick in some holler <laughs> down south and just have mm. a really great discussion about uh, the moonshiners <laughs> and how we both uh, just love to celebrate life and how they've inspired us. Oh, I like this. I like this. And you have to wear those plastic lays. Yeah, yeah, and you can go. We're gonna shine and holler. That's it. The rebel yell. I love this rebel spirit. Like I could see a whole rebel spirit series of books coming out now. Like, like you know, shine, weed. <laughs> you know, just say, just, I see this whole series coming out. Yeah. Jaywalking. Yeah, you know, jaywalking. I know. Is it even illegal now? Jaywalking. Oh, of course, you can get a ticket for it. Really? Okay. Yeah. Oh well. Oh well. I have no <laughs> idea what's legal or not, and I don't care. There, there, <laughs> there, anyway. there are more. There, uh, there are finer things to get in trouble for than jaywalking. If you're going to get in no. trouble, <laughs> get in trouble. I have been know? in trouble on the beach with a, a a horse, like the horse cop. You know, horse police come in, and it was oh, a Fourth of July yeah. party. Oh yeah. And I didn't realize that. You know, I, Kind of new to this country at this point. Um, coming from South Africa, you can do a lot. Um, and I didn't know you couldn't have Wiggy in a plastic container on the beach. I thought I was being safe. Apparently, no Wiggy on the beach. No. <laughs> None. And, <laughs> and do not play with a horse. That is not cool. But I thought it was cool. And uh, double duty in trouble, but n- not bad. Later, I directed Where? traffic, but no one needs to know. <laughs> Whereas I tend to get in trouble when I'm dancing on top of a table at a dive bar at about two oh, in the morning because oh. it's be- with <gasps> friends. But you know what? Oh, uh, again, you are. I, I I always find that by the that. time they yell at you, you've already had your fun. So the joke's exactly. on them. <laughs> exactly. But, and, and and you've learned not to go to one end of the table because the table flips. I know. There's a balance. There's a balance. No. Okay. Well, so I, I've back learned in our that day. the hard way. Yeah, I love this. I lo- okay, so when our, we're going to see you on our tour somewhere, wherever we are. Yes. If we can meet on a shine trail spot, I'm going to do. We're going to do the shine trail. It's going to be our happy hour mm. across the country. When we had our band back in the day, we did this gig at this horse ranch in the <laughs> desert in San Diego area, oh, Borrego, oh and it was crazy. There was this Romanian drunk lady, Gita. <laughs> And she was chasing people, and we all got, and, you know, there was music playing after this was, like, one of the breaks. We all got on this table, those plastic long tables. Oh, and we all, the band got up on there, and then one of the band's girlfriends, the skinniest, tiniest little girl, gets up on the table, and the entire thing collapsed. <laughs> Everybody went down. And then Gita still went out because she was grabby Gita. I'd go up in the side of the at the moon. Yeah, she did. She did. She was crazy, crazy Gita. But anyway, that was a – anyway, yeah. Any Anytime we can dance on the table, we should. Everybody go get the book, Moonshine, a celebration of America's original rebel spirit. It is out now by John Schlimm. And also go to his website, johnschlimm.com. He's on Twitter. He's on Facebook. He's on Instagram. Uh, connect him with there. Go to Amazon. Get it wherever you go and buy books. Go get it. Get it for the holiday season. Get it for while you're cooking that turkey. Get it for after the turkey for your friends and family for the holidays. Get it for the new year because everyone should start the new year with a shine. So that's what I have to say about that. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, John. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you uh, to you two. This has been so fun, and I will definitely see you out on the moonshine trail. Yeah, oh, cool. you've got to. You've got to meet us at a shine place. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll we're making a trail. Absolutely. And we can have a shine picnic, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we want to do that. We want to do that. But we're going to play a song because, like, Tennessee is good, right, for shine. And, and so what, this is Tennessee whiskey, not shine, but it's Tennessee whiskey uh, from Shelly King, one of our favorite musicians. So we had to play that. And it's off of her latest album, Fan Faves. Everyone go check it out at ShellyKing.com. 
So here it is, a little Tennessee whiskey for you. Thanks so much, John. You take care. You too. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Clink, clink, our big clinks from the jugs and the jars. Oh, well, well. Uh, yeah, I know. Here it is, Tennessee Whiskey. Everybody stay tuned. We've got some more coming up. We've got some wine decanting and uh, some lessons about criminal Kool-Aid cocktails. So here it is, Tennessee Whiskey first. <laughs> Again, that, that was Tennessee Whiskey by Shelly King, and you can go to her website, ShellyKing.com. That's fan faved her latest album, and you see, she's just awesome. Mood. Yeah, she's she's Mood. she's like, you know, she's mm. cool. I bet you she's got moonshine in her history, because she knows how to sing about it. Well, that's I'm going to ask her. I'm going to ask Uh-oh. her. She, we know she knows how to cook, and her family does. I yeah, mean, that's the, true. She was on a holiday show last year and mm-hmm. giving us some good recipe for rum balls. There you go. So I'm telling you, you guys, you guys had a whole conversation about I rum know. and whiskey balls. That was your thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but everybody, welcome back to Big Blend Radio. Our next, what's our happy hour show? So it is Wine Wednesday. So I had a conversation with Hillary Larson, the oh, wine queen. Yes. We love Hillary. I hate she's coming back on our show October 24th. Cool. Uh, our world party show to talk about her world travels. I mean, she's been all over France, yeah. England, all kinds of places. So, you know, in search of the best wine. Oh, you know. what a hard job. I know. Southern I, France. I know. I know. So I'm uh, excited to have her back on the show. Um, but on this segment, she shared some tips on decanting wine. I had no idea we had to knew, know, like, how to decant wine. It needs to be. Apparently so. So take a listen, and after that, we're going to talk about criminal Kool-Aid cocktails and uh, play some more music. So here awesome. it is, a little bit of uh, good wine knowledge from Hillary Larson. <laughs> So a lot of 
us will think uh, whiskey or scotch has a decanter, right, those fancy glass bottles on a tray. Or then you think about decanting wine and, and the wine actually breathing. We always hear about we need to remember to breathe and, and enjoy and be, you know, not less stressed out in the world. And I always look at wine going, well, wine helps me with that. Uh, so, you know what, it's time for Wine 101 with Hilary Larson. She's a sommelier, and she's taught me how to say that word. And she's a wine educator and also the co-owner of North Winds Wine Consulting and one of our big blend expert food, wine, and travel writers and radio contributors. I encourage you to go to her website, northwindswineconsulting.com, especially if you're a winery or a restaurant or anyone in the hospitality industry. And also, if you go to blendradioandtv.com and go to our expert department, you'll find Hillary there, and you can read her articles and listen to past interviews. And she is always educating us on wine, and it's it's a, actually quite fascinating over the time that we've had Hillary on our shows. Um, I didn't even know there was this much to wine, but apparently decanting, I didn't even thought about decanting in wine. I just thought it was whiskey and scotch, Hillary. What's up with this? <laughs> <laughs> decanting is very important, and just like you were saying, wines need to breathe. They are living, evolving little creatures inside those bottles, and they they need some air sometimes. Okay, so they need air. So they need to breathe. And I know that especially with red wine, we always talk about that. You get the red wine home. Uh, do you need to have, you have to bring the temperature, the wine has to be at the correct temperature, right, before you start yes. opening it up and breathing it out. Okay, or breathing it out, if that's even a term. Um, <laughs> but you're op- you're opening it up, and, you know, you take your first sip. Like when you go to a restaurant, let's start there, or a wine, ta- well, wine tasting room have their own thing, but in a restaurant, they bring this wine out, they give a sip to somebody, say, te- you know, check this, is this good, is this what you want? At that point, has that wine been sitting open for a while and changed, or did they just open it and pour it, and then you have to decide whether or not they're going to let it breathe? That sounds At terrible. a restaurant, <laughs> ni- 99.9% of the time, they take the cork out in front of you and pour that small sample into the glass for you to taste it and judge it as suitable for consumption. And that's wow. mostly the case. And even if it's an, an older vintage, you know, in a better class of restaurant, they will open it for you and have you taste it, and then they'll either decant it or uh, pour your glass and let it sit for a while while, you know, you enjoy your glass of white wine mm. or your glass of champagne and let it uh, breathe in your glass. But, yes, most of the time there's only a moments and seconds between the time that cork comes out of the bottle and that uh, tasting sample is poured for you. Oh, now this is interesting. So basically like you start, you know, we always have sometimes the pre-dinner cocktail, right? This mm-hmm. is the beauty of going out and having a really good dinner. You have the pre-cocktail, you know, like pre-dinner cocktail, and then you'll sit down and have champagne or a white wine. And it's interesting because, like, how the whole – is said it's like okay this could be a first date i need the cocktail okay (laughs) now the edge is off then you're gonna go sit down and have a little champagne and okay now i'm feeling back to being cheery self (laughs) you know i could do this it always helps and then or the white wine and at that point now you're going into more of the beginning courses of the meal the appetizer and uh you know you're looking at a lighter so the white wine does that not to that doesn't need to be decanted like the red wine. So, you know, when we get to the red wine and you taste it, you've got this slowing progression of the meal, which is allowing that red wine in the restaurant to breathe. Am I getting this straight? <laughs> well, yeah, most of us do think about decanting going with red wine, but a lot of white wines uh, will benefit from being decanted as well, especially things like a, an oak Chardonnay mm-hmm. as an example. Because when you th- – I always – tell my students, look at it this way, okay, when was the last time you took a really long airplane flight, say about Mm. five hours plus, and think about when that plane landed at your destination, what was the first thing you wanted to do? Breathe. You wanted to, yeah, you wanted to stand up and you wanted to stretch and you wanted to get out of that stuffy airplane and Mm -hmm. breathe some fresher air, right? So wine is the same. You know, it's been inside this bottle for goodness knows how long. And once the cork is out of the bottle, 
it needs to breathe. It needs to stretch. It needs to get itself back together again. And that's the only way it's going to show you everything that it has. So decanting white wines, definitely. And uh, decanting red wines, definitely. The only ones that are a bit iffy are uh, red wines uh, or white wines that have uh, a bit of age to them, an older cellared wine, because they're a little more fragile and you have to be careful of how much exposure to the air they receive. But most of us don't need to concern ourselves with those kinds of wines. They're not the kind of thing we're going to be drinking on a regular basis. Hmm. That's interesting. And, and decanting, you know, because we think about those decanters of the whiskey and the scotches and all that, and, and it's already moved from one bottle to the next, like it's been moved. So there's already already this change that's happening. And half the time, we're, we're, I mean, we're, wine just comes out of its own bottle. We don't do that with, with scotch and whiskey. You know what I mean? There's like this whole, mm-hmm. why do we put it in its own bottle? You know, here, we're changing it out. You don't know. Like, that's it. It's going in this little glass bottle. And so there's a change that happens when you do that. But, you know, when you think about wine, it's staying in its own bottle half the time, right? Or is it going into another bottle? Well, when you think of those beautiful, faceted, sparkly crystal decanters that were used for uh, uh, spirits and um, Mm -hmm. whiskeys and ports and so on, they became very fashionable in the Georgian and Victorian era because that's when they discovered that if you mixed lead into the glass, you could make thicker bottles and thicker glasses, Mm. and they were also uh, much harder, so you could carve those intricate designs that caught the candlelight and sparkled on the dinner table. They were also very expensive, so if you had those, and you poured your whiskey into it to be to have your servant bring to the table at the end of a dinner, you were showing off your wealth. And uh, oh. that's why they were so popular and so collectible. When it comes to wine, wow. you would really don't want to have your wine in one of those fancy cut glass decanters because you want something that is clear and uh, doesn't have any design or markings on it because you want to be able to see the wine, just like with wine glasses. You know, for years you'd see Mm -hmm. all those colored wine glasses or they'd have gold or platinum on them. Yeah. And they look really pretty on the table, but they're not the best for enjoying your wine because you can't see the true color of the wine. So with the decanters, when you pour your wine into the decanter, you're bringing in oxygen and you're helping that wine to stretch out and, as we were saying, to breathe. And as it breathes, it uh, starts to show off more of its aromas. If it's a red wine, the tannins, which are the components that give the wine its body and sometimes that kind of puckery feeling that you get in your mouth, Mm -hmm. uh, it will help to bring those down a little bit as well. So that's why decanting is is such a a wonderful uh, tool in the wine drinker's cabinet. This is really fascinating because you know what it reminds me of? Now I look at wine as Robin Williams because he always talks about, like, spring reminds us to go out and party, you know, and he always used to do those sketches of, you know, the comedian uh, Robin Williams sketches of Mm -hmm. animals and, you know, like dogs and stuff and going crazy. And it's like you can almost imagine, like, the wine is being birthed. Like it's like I'm out now. I'm out. I want to party. I want to. I want to get out there. <laughs> like it's like let's let's jump around. You know that's how I look at the wine now. Like it's a whole different thing now. It's like mm-hmm. it is and like the birthing. That's it's crazy. <laughs> and it, and it does change. I mean, think about you know we all uh, probably if we like wine and we like to cook then it's fun to put the two together, to pour yourself a glass Mm -hmm. of wine and sip on it as you're getting your meal ready. And next time you do that, have a sip of your wine and then, you know, go chop up some onions or start working on your meal. Come back about 15, 20 minutes later and have another sip. And I Mm. can pretty well guarantee you it won't taste the same as the first one. And if you come back another five or ten minutes after that, that one's going to taste a little different as well because the wine is opening up, the oxygen is mingling with it, the um, the scent molecules mm. are starting to move around and release their aromas, the alcohol is rising out of the glass and carrying these scents with it. So that's how your wine will change. 
And I think most of us have done that. And if we think back, we'll go, yeah, you know, that's right. It did taste a little better that second and third mm-hmm. sip. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, I I think we've talked on this about this on a show before where I mean up in and Julian up in the mountains in San Diego uh, the, this winery is not there anymore, but um, Mike Hart now has it up there, Vulcan Mountain Winery, uh, with Jay Jenkins, and, and he's passed since. But he was a scientist, and he made this wine from a scientific approach, but his wine was, quite frankly, badass. This wine, he had this, 2000, it was 2004, 2005 to Raw sitting in the back, and just forgot about it, and didn't like it. And then we went to the tasting room, and tasted it, and it was amazing. But they had a bottle that was open uh, the day before, and they were like, taste the difference. It was like two different wines, mm-hmm. and you liked both of them. But it, be- it just the flavor profile was night and day. I mean, and yeah. this this wine, this Syrah, I have to say, we, it was back in 2012, I'm going to say, we tasted it. I mean, it, it had seven years on it. It was yeah. probably the some of the best wine I've ever had in my life, and it was amazing. But it was interesting to be able to taste the different stages. And the the lady in the tasting room, I mean, she really did a good job of having, like, here, now try this, now try it this way, you know. And it was all amazing, but it was, once it had had this time to breathe, had this richer, like, the berries were, like, there, man. It was, like, it, there was chocolate in there. There was everything. It was, like, yeah. good. I mean, it, <laughs> It was like heaven, you know. But at the same time, we've had wine where, I remember back in South Africa, somebody had found wine, and I swear it was almost 100 years old. I mean, when we were younger. Um, you know, I was younger. I was like, I didn't know about wine. But we all opened it up before it got thrown away. And this wine was like syrup, and it wasn't wine. Mm-hmm. And it was sad. So there's a line of, how long you keep wine, no matter what you deca- how long you decant it, it is this is syrup or it's, it's you can't keep it forever. No, and once a wine has been a bottle has been opened and has come mm. into contact with the air, the clock does start to tick because oh, okay. it's oxygen. Yes, it's a helpmate and it helps the wine breathe and open up, but then there gets to be a certain stage where it becomes the enemy. And the oxygen will start to uh, break down. The wine will start to break down. Oh wow! And because wine is a, a food product, after all, you know. Yeah, that's true. So yeah. yeah, because I think what it was is we could almost feel like the alcohol leaving the bottle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the syrup, that syrup, I'll never forget that. Everybody was so excited, thinking this is going to be the most amazing thing from this, you know, ancient wine. And we all looked at each other like. Well, that was a big disappointment. Enough of that. Yeah, so when, didn't it, when you went to pour it, was it just like treacle coming out of the bottle? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I remember a friend of ours up in, in Sonoma, too, uh, someone that, like, I don't know how he ended up with all these liqueurs, like this one that he's like, come over, come over. And he was like, they were, like, cleaning the house. Here all these liqueurs, I mean, Baileys and everything, right? Same thing. It was like almost jam inside there. I mean, you couldn't even get it out. It was like, why didn't you just throw this away? But none of us yeah. thought that. We always thought alcohol would live forever. <laughs> That's all I have to say but wine, you know, is mostly water, just like grapes are mostly water. So if the wine mm. is in, improperly stored, in the, wa- the water will evaporate, especially, you know, with bottles like you're talking about that have been sitting there for 100 years. It's just going to simply evaporate as the cork shrinks and leave behind the uh the sugar hmm. and the colors wow. that that were in the uh in the grapes grape skins and yeah and that's why you ended up with a a grapey syrup <laughs> yeah we did i mean it was just really crazy well thank you so much hillary everybody again uh, you can go to northwindswineconsulting.com and also blendradioandtv.com to read Hillary's articles and listen to interviews. Thanks so much. Salute. Salute.
awesome. You know, I, I so now we know all about drinking. I didn't <laughs> think about cork shrinkage. Nobody wants that. Well, again, properly stored. Some people know how to properly store wine that will last for, you know, years and years and years without that. But I think you have to be really careful and you got to twist the bottle and let it resettle and you got to keep it cooler and, and you got to make sure that it's sealed. It's so interesting about how, like, even how a bottle rests how that affects mm. the wine. You remember? It's, it's all chemistry. The, I remember Linda Kassam, you know, the diva, taking us on a mm. tour of Thornton Winery in Temecula, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. where we saw how, because they were one of the few people that actually do the real uh, champagne method. Champagne met- you can normally say it, I can't. Um, Meso de chambois. Uh, yeah, no, that's wrong. No, but it was they were showing how like the the champagne was you know resting on those racks and everything, and I was like, I didn't think that happened. You know, to me it was I had no clue until we went there and got to see how they would rotate the bottles and you know this this whole thing. I mean, it's science. Mm-hmm. It's crazy cool yeah. science that makes us very happy, makes our wiggy butts. So you know, they, shake and rattle and roll. You, if they taught you this in chemistry, a lot more people would pass. Exactly. That's what everybody should go to wineries, shineries, exactly. distilleries, and, and uh, everybody and would be good. And learn about chemistry. Exactly. I love that. Um, so Yuma Landing Bar and Grill is attached to the historic Coronado Motor Hotel, both located in Yuma, Arizona, which is home to the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area, the Lower Colorado River, where mm-hmm. people crossed over during the gold rush time in Arizona to get up to California. Um, there's the Anza Trail, the Juan Batista de Anza National Historic Trail that goes through there, which is part of the uh, Juan Batista de Anza n- expedition of bringing people, over 240 people you know, walking in 1776 from Mexico to find, like basically set up San Francisco, the Presidio at mm-hmm. that point. Yuma has huge history. Part of that history is also air history. Uh, The very first airplane that touched down in Arizona happened to be at the site where this bar is. Um, And this bar happens to be part of our tour headquarters, our Love Your Parks tour headquarters. Uh, The car not that happened. I know. So um, this is this this next segment uh, was recorded a little while ago. Um, back on our tour, uh, Nancy and I uh, stayed at the uh, Coronado Motor Hotel, and their restaurant is right there, the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill. And uh, the hotel's uh, celebrating 80 years this mm-hmm. year. Uh, and the actual touchdown happened in October of this airplane, October 25th, 1911. Mm. So we got to celebrate that. And that was when uh, Robert Fowler, the pilot, uh, he had a right model B air, a biplane known as a coal flyer, mm-hmm. and uh, it weighed 800 pounds, and it was capable of reaching a top speed of 45 miles per hour. Think about this, I you know, know, 1911. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he touched down there, and then they had to, like, in the, it was a field at that point, like, a, and then they had to push it and get it back up, and they did um, get it back up into the air. And this guy, and he kept flying because he was on a flight going across country, Right? Wasn't he going from Santa Monica to Florida? And Something like yeah. that. And I mean, there is a nice monument there now. Yes. Which I'm glad to see. Over a hundred years of Yuma Aviation. It's mm-hmm. right outside the uh, restaurant. But it's it's interesting because Amelia Earhart was there. I mm-hmm. mean, it, this is this is an area of aviation. Of course, they have the Marine Corps out there too. So it's it's so much history, military aviation, crossing. Uh, they got the Yuma Territorial Prison. Well, we like that. We like that. So, you know, 310 to Yuma, just saying. Yes. So, anyway, the Car and Automoto Hotel is our tour headquarters. When we travel again, phase two of our Love Your Parks tour, where Nancy and I will be traveling full time for three to five years, really until we, like, melt or Thelma and Louise, <laughs> we're just going to keep going until that's the end of it. Uh, we're on a mission to really go to every single national park unit in the country, uh, cover the parks. There's over 417 of them. Cover the gateway communities, cover the state parks, and all the, the parks, moonshine. the communities, and the shine, the happy hours. <laughs> You'll be seeing a happy hour report as we tour. Um, but this has been our tour headquarters in the last tour, and we'll be again. And so we want to give a personal thank you 
to Yvonne and John Peach over at the Coronado Motor Hotel for putting up with us again. Uh, so check it out. Go to CoronadoMotorHotel.com and YumaLanding.com uh, to check out because it's an amazing place. And don't forget the museum. The museum, exactly. Mm. The Yuma mm. uh, Society of History and Yuma Aviation. Historical Society of Aviation and History. I'm used to saying Casa de Coronado, Casa which de is actually Coronado. the house of where everything is stored and the museum is in. So very interesting uh, about travel history, tourism. human history, mm-hmm. uh, tourism history. It's amazing. You go in, it's like you're on Route 66. So It's awesome. Cool place. All right, so here it is, my conversation with Heather, the mixologist. Um, and, of course, I wasn't tasting, right, Nancy? Oh, no, of course not. Not at all. Um, and after that, we've got some more music. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, this is Lisa with Big Blend Radio, and we're at the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill in Yuma, Arizona. And you know, this is a real historic place, and I'm having a really good time sipping all these cocktails with <laughs> Heather Witherington, who's a mixologist. She's not sipping them, but I sure am. I wish I was. And um, this cocktail, the Yuma Criminal, really Yuma goes back Criminal. to Yuma's history of football. Yeah. And um, I think it's it's going to be criminal because it's going to be one of those that kind of sneak up on you when you're smiling. Second, I think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Second, maybe third drink in. Yeah. Well, it's the color of the Yuma Criminals. And the Yuma Criminals, as I understand, they actually they became a football team. Well, at one time, they, they, there was a fire at the high fire school. Fire at high school. And I think it was in the 40s or 50s. Um, I don't know the actual date. And then they went to school in, in the prison, the, the Yuma territory. Territorial Prison. I mean, in that prison, it's a, it's a, everyone's got to go to the Territorial yes, Prison. Yes, a lot of people come to Yuma just for the prison. Yes, they do. And to see Pearl Hart in there. Yes. I like Pearl Hart. The story of Pearl Hart. She's. I love women vigilantes. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it should be, you know? Um, but anyway, so they ended up actually having to go to school in there. And then one day um, they were all, and then they went back to high school after, you know, the high school was rebuilt. But then they went and played a game in Phoenix and basically crushed the Phoenix team. And they got mad and like, you, you, the criminal. <laughs> and so now they actually do wear stripes. It's blue and white stripes. Yes. As criminals. And um, they're proud of it. If you talk to anybody from Yuma that's a criminal, man, they're, they're proud. They're, they're very proud. So this should be the Yuma, the proud Yuma criminal. Yes. We could call it Yuma criminal Kool-Aid. Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. I like that. <laughs> but why? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> criminal Kool-Aid. Can we change a name? Sure. <laughs> okay. Another sip and something else will change. <laughs> Who knows? But um, everyone, if you go to YumaLanding.com, you can learn about the history of the Yuma Landing because this is where the very first airplane landed in the state of Arizona. And you can get all your recipes, too. Yes, you can. You guys have tons of recipes on that website. Yes, we do. And that's the thing to do is sign up for the newsletter because then we feature them every month in there. You sign up and you have them, too. Yep. And you have all the cocktails. Yes. You have everything. If you sign up for the newsletter, that's the other thing. People can enter to win a $25 gift certificate from the Yuma Landing every yes. month. Every month. So check that out, YumaLanding.com, and come be a criminal and drink some criminal Kool-Aid because it's cool. Because it's cool. Dude. And <laughs> oh, on the side note, everyone, the uh, museum at the hotel, the Casa de Coronado Museum, which is all connected to the Yuma Landing. There's a Coronado Motor Hotel. This is one huge property. Yes. It's like the whole side of this well, two sides of the street here uh, the hotel. It's, all, it's almost an entire block long. Yep. It's, it's big. <laughs> it's really big. It's a, and a fascinating history. But in the museum, they actually have a whole display on the criminals. Come check it out. I wonder if they'll let us walk over there with our cocktails and maybe not. That might be frowned upon. <laughs> I heard that you can take wine back to your room. A wine. wine. Yes. Wine. But that's, that's that it. That is it. There. A bottle yeah. of wine. Like if you started, but you have to start drinking it here. Yes. So you could take a sip and go back to your room. Could. Do people do that all um, I've been here a little over two years and I've never had anybody ask. They're, they're having too much fun in here. Yeah. That's what it is. Why take it home when you can stay here? Yeah, well, and you might spill. Or why take it back to the hotel yeah. when you can... Yeah, you, you might spill. That's a big problem. Yes. Yeah, because I know that when I leave here, there's a good chance of, if I'm carrying anything, of spillage. So that that is not good. That is not good for you. <laughs> but thanks so much, Heather. I didn't sing that, but oh, I could. Really? I could. 
Mm-hmm. I could. Um, you know what? I can't wait to get back on the road. I know. It's so much Are you fun. ready? Like we're gonna happy oh, hour. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna have like happy hour hopping. We're gonna do the shine trail, yeah. the wine trail, the distillery trail, the beer trail. Because beer, like breweries, are popping up like everywhere. It's just gonna be fun. There's a lot it's of. It's about time to have fun now. I like all these, you know, brewery pop-ups and things. Brewery pop-ups. I know. I, I'm all into that. <laughs> um, I want to thank everyone for listening to Big Blend Radio's Happy Hour Show. It's always good to be live and have some fun with you guys. And uh, hope everybody's doing good. The season is here. The fall season is here, which means more cocktails and happiness. I love fall. I know. Fall is awesome. And uh, even here in Tucson, Arizona, we've had some interesting fall weather. And uh, makes you want to have another glass of shine or wine. So uh, everybody, toast to you for listening. Toast to everyone joining us on the show. Uh, John Schlimm, awesome book, Moonshine. Again, go get the the shine. Um, And also Hillary Larson. uh, She's always just got so much good information, and she's so much fun. She's fun. fun. Can't wait to have her back on the show. And Heather over at Human Landing Bar and Grill, who's put up with us uh, for a number of years, hanging out in the bar and creating all kinds of shenanigans. Oh, we're just having fun. I know, I know. My excuse, um, I'm hey, sticking to it. I'm all good with that. Uh, don't forget, Big Blend Radio airs Sunday through Friday. The schedule is up on BigBlendRadio.com. You can listen live uh, or anytime later on demand and uh, through all kinds of places, like here on Blog Talk Radio, YouTube, uh, I was going to say Instagram. No, you can't listen there. Um, But we do post our shows there at Big Blend Radio TV. Um, But we are on uh, Spotify. We're on iHeartRadio, TuneIn, iTunes. Um, There's a big list. It's up there. So thank you all for joining us. We're going to close with some good music. Cool. Allison August. We all love right. her. And apparently mm-hmm. she's working on another album. Oh, good. You know, that makes me so happy. Uh, we love her voice. and We love her songs. Uh, this one is Holy Water, the title track to her latest album. And you can go to her website, allisonaugust.com. But here it is, some holy water, because that's why we sip and smile. You've been blessed. You've been blessed. Here it is. Hey, apparently we learned that it helps in prohibition that, you know, you've been blessed. Kept saved some, you know, vines in there. You'll hear that story uh second Friday uh, uh October, second Friday in October with Corey Solomon and her travels through uh, Livermore, California. Mm. She had a wine tasting adventure with a lot of history. I did not know all that about Livermore being mm. like such a historic wine place, you know? It all starts with the grape. Again, second Friday in October, uh, Livermore, California, wine history. All right, here it is. Holy water. Take care, everybody. Don't spill, don't drink, and drive. I've been working.